I'd like to introduce Ben Moores, who's uh, one of our markets forecast analysts uh, and, and our defense trade manager. He will be presenting this session, Global Defense Trade Review Analysis and Opportunities. And as some of you might know, this is our, now our fifth year of presenting this balance of trade review to our customers. The IHS Jane's Intelligence Briefing Program will consist of about 40 events uh, during 2017 and is available to all customers of Jane's Intelligence Center and module products, including the markets forecast products. So it's a pleasure, as I say, to introduce Ben, who is one of Jane's most quoted aerospace and defense uh, experts in 2017. So I'm sure we're in for a thought-provoking discussion and, and uh, with your help, a lively discussion. The uh, information for, uh, for this uh, seminar today is taken primarily from, as you can see on the screen here, from the Defence Markets Forecast suite of products. Welcome everybody to uh, the Global Defence Trade Review, uh, Balance of Trade. Um, so as uh, per usual, I'm going to go over quickly uh, what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, we're going to talk about the sort of data we've used to put this project together. Then I'm going to talk about how we process that, some of the slight changes we might have made. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the data who want to know how we did this. Then I'm going to talk about the key findings. Uh, then look at the global picture, uh, some of the leading importers, what's happening there, what's changing, some of the exporters by country and by uh, company. Then we're going to look at how the uh, market's changing a sort of technology and platform level. And then we're going to look at some, uh, some of the rising opportunities over the past year for exports, some of the fallers, and then look at, look at a couple of case studies as to countries I think are doing a little of interest to, to uh, our, our listeners. As John's pointed out, we use the market's forecast product as the basis for this, this tool, which, is, uh, which covers you know, platforms, services, mission systems, and weapons. It, um, it only really excludes weapons beneath 57 millimeters caliber. Um, so it's important to note the following. Uh, the, when, when we start talking about you know, billions and millions of dollars today, you know, what are we actually including? Well, first of all, if this is all deliveries, not budgets. Um, it's certainly not sales. Um, it's all bottom up, so it's highly granular. Uh, it's global, uh, except for maybe the last 2% of the market. Um, it only includes funds released to industry. It's no classified project. Now, first of all, I think it's important to determine to, to outline how big the total market is. So, you know, we can put everything into perspective. The total market is global defense markets worth about 1.6 trillion. You can see there that it rose very quickly up till 2011. Then the financial crash uh, began to have a, an impact and you saw a, a decline in spending in the West, although note the rest of the world continued to ex expand its defense spending by and large. And now that the West is not cutting back so much, or at least uh, or even some parts growing, you're starting to see the uh, forecast is to grow. Now of that 1.6 trillion, about a quarter, 400 million, is, uh, is defense procurement. And of about half of that is not really accessible because it's really China and USA. Now obviously elements of that are accessible, but by and large, um, I think it's safe to say that only really 200 billion globally of defense, defense equipment procurement is really accessible. The key difference from last year is this is that the export backlog has fallen by about 5%. And it you can see it declined slightly there. Well, normally it stabilizes. And this is the first time we've seen a projected decline. Now, I think this is happening for a number of reasons. I think uh, maybe commodity price falls, having a knock-on effect on procurement, um, increasing domestic production for some technologies. And I think perhaps in some respects, the world is pausing for breath after such a long run of increases. And I think part of that is perhaps preparing for the next stage of where the F-35 has such a huge impact on the chart, as you'll see. MENA, East Asia, and Western Europe are the, the dominant markets. Um, MENA's been increasing for years. The Western Europe is starting to expand slowly again. Uh, and East Asia is expanding despite the fact that China is becoming self-sufficient. China really has one last, last, last project now from the Russians, these SU-35s, and once that's gone through, it'll really be spares and engines. Russia's seen its market share fall. Its captive markets are looking to alternative suppliers. Um, worryingly for Russia, one of its main captive markets, China, is now increasingly competing against it and has made you know, some significant gains in, in poorer parts of the world. 
Russia has a, a strong short-term backlog, um, especially in ships and aircraft. So we're not forecasting a, a strong, uh, a large decline, certainly in the next couple of years anyway. The U.S. has got this huge uh, dominance across a sway, wide swathe of markets. But if we look at its primary suppliers in 2016, they are really their regional allies. And, um, of course, that looks quite cemented, but with you know, news in the last couple of weeks uh, and you know, the U.S. being perceived perhaps not to be as reliable as it once was, uh, then some of those countries may turn to alternative uh, sources. And what's concerning for Russia is that these countries are increasingly looking to outside suppliers. You know, India bought C-130s, P-8s, and Apaches from the U.S., and they bought Rafale fighter jets from France. China is looking to, as I said, looking to replace Russia entirely. Uh, Algeria is still upset when the Russians delivered them second-hand aircraft that were refurbished as, and delivered as first-hand. Uh, Vietnam is has been actively looking to buy equipment from America for the first time, in particular P-3 aircraft. And Egypt has been looking to France. Azerbaijan has been building strong ties with Israel. If we look at the Russian backlog, and this just underscores the issue, really, just how dependent Russia is on a few countries and just how difficult the loss of some of those countries might be. You can see there India is very important to them. They can't afford to fall out with India. This chart shows us the total unawarded procurement planned over the coming decade, and which is then multiplied by the percentage that of uh, percentage uh, that we think the country will import based on their historical propensity to import and their recent investments. So you can see there, no, no great surprises and certainly no huge change over last year. Um, and, but I think what's worth highlighting is that you know, most of these countries are relatively open to business. Um, you know, bar Algeria, which tends to buy from Russia, um, as we'll go into more depth later, uh, Pakistan and Egypt are kind of relying on financial support from China and the U.S. Egypt, as I, as I said, perhaps increasingly reliant now from other Sunni nations. Um, Taiwan, which tends to be a bit of a closed market for political reasons. Um, but, you know, the rest of them, India, Saudi, UAE, Indonesia, South Korea, Vietnam, Australia, they're, they're all relatively open to who, uh, who they might acquire from. So right. that was the best ones. Now, who are the worst? Well, um, this work chart works the same as the last chart. It's just that these are negative figures. Uh, Venezuela, uh, outstandingly, has led for a second year. It's quite difficult to do that, but that really underlines the problems that Venezuelans have. Um, certainly reviewing this country this year, we uh, you know, there's big, big cutbacks, um, not only in, in their deliveries, but in, the, in their opportunities. Uh, Denmark's uh, awarded quite a few contracts this year, which has pushed it down a bit. Uh, Greece has been cut back again, another year again, it's this, this lack of an economic recovery, uh, it's, just, it's just not coming. Uh, so every year we have to slash them back and particularly the opportunity. Uh, I remember doing Bangladesh years ago and uh, you know, a lot of this equipment is second-hand gear from the 1960s. You know, a, a lot of uh, free, free equipment has been given uh, that it sort of somehow keeps in service. But I think that's changing. But you can see there that in pre re recent years there have been They've been getting a lot of cut price equipment from China, and prior to that, the Russians. But going forwards, I think that the Bangladeshis will buy more Western equipment, certainly because Bangladesh is much richer than it has been in previous years. You know, much of this equipment, such as the helicopters, combat net radios, satellites, and fighters, Thailand will be looking to the West, not to Russia or China, uh, because they're not able to supply the quality that Thailand needs in those areas and that Thailand can actually afford. The Middle East obviously continues to dominate especially through Saudi growth, but the growth rate is dropping and opportunities are dropping even faster. So that is, I think, could be a defining trend, especially as more money goes into operations. The manned aviation segment is just dominated by the F-35. It, it's going to be difficult not to talk about this for fear of repetition, but you know, there are no new entrants close to breaking into that kind of segment. Thank you, Ben. Uh, a uh, good session of ooh, well over 40 minutes, so uh, well done. Uh, we'll look forward to welcoming you on future uh, online briefings. And the next subject is Iranian air defenses, examining current and future capabilities in an age of uncertainty, uh, which uh, should, be, should be absolutely fascinating. And that will take place on the 6th of July. Thank you.